Well, thank you so much for this uh, kind invitation. It's a real honor to be here and um, tell you today about what, what we have been working about in the last couple of years. So I presume this is a very broad audience. So I'll you know, try to do my best and introduce everything that, that I want to talk about. So you know, let me just say a few words about viruses in general. So what you, what you see here on this slide is sketches of, of four different viruses that infect the different domains of life. So this is a plant virus, so-called tobacco mosaic virus. This would be a virus that infects bacteria, bacterial phage, as they call. And then there's two more viruses here, the influenza virus and the human immunodeficiency virus. And those are the two that I'll spend a little bit more time on here. These Viruses, they are really not much more than a genome that codes for a few things and a capsid around them. And they don't, they rely on a host to replicate, right? So by themselves, they don't do anything. They're just an instruction how to make copies of themselves, plus some envelope that helps them to get out of the cell and into the next cell and start, start the machinery to replicate, right? And these genomes they co that code for these instructions, they are pretty short. They are typically on the order of you know, 10,000 bases. There's quite a bit of variation, so I put here five to 50,000 base pairs. There are some exceptions. There are some viruses that are actually millions of base pairs long, but you know, pretty much all viruses that we typically deal with are in this ballpark. And as you, of course, know, a large number of infectious diseases are caused by viral, viral pathogens. And you know, many people like to think of these viruses as, yeah, as nasty things that, 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 do, that make us sick. But one should keep in mind that they have actually a very important role in some microbial ecosystems and are responsible for a large fraction of the biomass turnover in, in the oceans and, and everywhere, really. They are the most abundant organisms on the planet. And some people estimate that there is on the order of 10 to the 31 viruses out there. So basically, ballpark 10 viruses for every cell on the planet. And how many microbes? Yeah, 10 to the 30. So <laughs> yeah, so that's, there's, there's 10 viruses for every microbe. That's, or, and animals and plants don't really make much of a difference in that, <laughs> on the scale of things. <laughs> Yeah, so what I'm going to do today, I'll talk about the evolution of HIV to begin with. And then I'll introduce a number of theoretical concepts that we developed, we and others developed, to understand evolution of these kind of very rapidly evolving, evolving populations. And then move over to influenza and try to apply these concepts to predict flu that is going to circulate next year. Or anticipate what of the existing variation is going to take over and, and circulate in a year to come. So let's start with HIV. HIV is a retrovirus that is circulating among a large number of different animals. So here it only shows the monkeys and primates. And there have been sort of many transmissions between different animals, and that includes humans. So HIV has been transmitted from chimpanzees to humans, from gorillas to humans, from Sudi mangabees to humans. And those are only the ones we know about. So there probably have been you know, many, many such cross-species transmissions in, in the past. And the most consequential of them is this transmission from chimpanzees to humans. That, there's actually several that happened, but the most consequential of them is this one transmission that gave rise to what's called the HIV group M, which probably happened around 1900, <laughs> give or take a couple of years, a couple of maybe two, three decades. And this one transmission has resulted in order of magnitude 100 million infections over these, over these round about 100 years. Ever since this happened, and this was just you know, one single event where you know, one virus or a group of very similar viruses sort of jumped from a chimpanzee to a human, probably in the context of bushmeat hunting, something like that. And this, this one instance has since diversified and 
evolved into a number of different subtypes that now differ at something between 10 and 20% of the positions of, their, of the HIV genome. Just to put this in context, we and chimpanzees, we are different at about 1% of our sites, sites in the genome, right? So the, the distance in relative terms that these viruses have covered evolutionarily is about 10 times, 10 times or more the distance between human and chimp. So it's really a system where you can observe quite macroevolutionary processes in a very short amount of time. Um, yeah, so this rate here it translates to, to about one in a thousand changes per, changes per uh, year, meaning in 10 years, this virus covers the distance between human and chimp. And the diversity that we observe is roughly comparable to the diversity in mammals. <coughs> All of this evolution, that happens within the individual, right? Because the virus needs a cell to replicate. So outside the individual, it doesn't, outside the infected person, it doesn't do anything. And what you see here is a little sketch of the typical course of an HIV infection. It, the red line here, that depicts the amount of virus that you find in a milliliter of blood in in an infected person, and that shoots up. It's on a logarithmic scale, and you know, there's quite a bit of variation in different individuals, sort of factor 10, factor 100, this can go up and down. But the general pattern is such that in the first few weeks, you have a big spike, followed by a decline of several orders of magnitude, and that decline is due to the adaptive immune system sort of starting to fight the virus. But it doesn't manage to to eradicate the virus population completely, the virus keeps replicating at a rather low level for many, many years if untreated. And during that period, the person is, is uninfect, uh, un asymptomatic and possibly doesn't even know about the status of infection, right? And that's, um, that's a big public health concern. So if the virus infection stays undiagnosed, at some point, the immune system will be worn out enough. And the state of the immune system here is shown by the blue curve. That is the number of CD4 positive cells per microliter of blood, which you know, goes down as the virus keeps replicating, because those are exactly the cells the virus, the virus infects. And once that falls below a certain level, um, the immune system can no longer defend the person against all kinds of infections. And the HIV positive person will eventually then die from opportunistic infections unless there's treatment. Treatment will basically bring down, at least the modern treatment we have today, will bring down this, this curve to undetectable. And as far as we know, people can live indefinitely on, on an effective antiviral treatment. Even in this asymptomatic phase, however, there's a lot of you know, the person doesn't seem sick in any sense of the word, but there's a lot of stuff going on. The virus is constantly fighting um, with the immune system. And in fact, there's 10 to the 8 cells, give or take, uh, infected every day here during these many, many years. And whenever the virus infects the cell, something like this, this happens, right? The virus binds to the surface of the cell. The, HIV, the genome that's inside the capsid will be injected into, the, into that cell. And the virus makes a copy of that genome, or the reverse transcriptase of the virus makes a copy of that genome, the RNA genome, into DNA. And that's where mutations happen. This RNA, this RNA polymerase, is, well, this RNA reverse transcriptase, the RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, is rather error-prone. It makes a, makes a mistake around about every 10,000 to 100,000 basis. And these mistakes, they keep accumulating over time. They allow the virus to change and respond to, to, to immune surveillance. Once this DNA is made, it's integrated into the genome of that cell. So in the, there's a human genome, and the, the virus genome is put in there somewhere. And then looks like just a regular piece of human DNA, only that it doesn't produce human proteins, but it produces viral proteins. And from these viral proteins, a new virus is made to infect the next cell. So there's one peculiarity of retroviruses that integrate into the human genome 
that sometimes this process just stops here. And no virus is made. Meaning all that happens is that the virus infects the cell. And after it has infected the cell, the cell carries a, with it a bit of DNA. That is just a piece of DNA. It's completely inert. And this virus is called the latently infected virus. And this latently infected virus, these latently infected cells, so these latent HAV, are the region, reason why people, once they start treatment, have to keep taking those drugs forever. Because the moment they stop taking those drugs, there's one of these many cells that have latently integrated virus that wakes up and seeds this infection to normal. And yes, what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes or so, tell you how this virus evolves while untreated, and then also what happens after treatment is, initi uh, after treatment is initiated. So within the individual, you are initially looking at a situation like this, where each of these black bars here um, is supposed to detect an H um, depict an HIV genome. And initially, right after infection, this is typically a very homogeneous population, meaning all these viruses are basically identical, with only very few differences here depicted by colored dots. And over the years, by this error-prone replication mechanism, you accumulate mutations. So these viruses start to differ bet between each other. At some positions, maybe one mutation spreads through the entire population and now completely de replaced that initial variant that infected the virus. <coughs> And this process, this is, this is testament of this immune, the immune surveillance and the, uh, the, the immune co-evolution of the virus and the immune system and the error prone replication. So in collaboration with Jan Albert at um, the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, we set out to study this process in, in great detail. And what we did, we identified a number of people, HIV positive people, for whom biobank samples were available that covered a very long part of the infection. So and we selected some such that we always had one sample very close to the, the, initial, the initial infection, and then a sample every, every year or so until they eventually went on, went on treatment. <coughs> so what you then do, you, well, you get those samples from the biobank, you extract the HIV genomes that, that sit in those samples. These are often very few, so you're typically dealing with just a few hundred to a few thousand to a few thousand of these genomes. So you need to amplify them by PCR, polymerase chain reaction. You basically copy them over and over again until you have enough to make a sequencing library and, and sequence all these genomes. So with modern sequencing technology, it's fairly straightforward to take a bunch of these DNA sequences and read them off in little snippets, little reads, that are maybe 100 or 300 or 500 base pairs long. And what you then get is a situation like this, where you have, you know, this might be the, 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 the template genome, and then you're, you're reading off bits and pieces of that, and the machine will give you millions to tens of millions, hundreds of millions of these snippets, and you can pile them up such that they, they nicely align. And then you also see whether there are some parts of the genome that have changed. So this, these little red Cs here would be, would be mutations that happened a while ago. And it's now present here in two out of these seven um, copies that I made. So if you look at that over, oh, it, yeah. So no, for, each of these, for each of these samples then, you have one kind of consensus sequence, kind of the majority rule sequence, right? You pile up all these, all these reads, and these are often thousands to millions of, of reads that you get, right? So because these machines are very, very powerful, they have a lot of throughput, so they, they'll sequence your virus genome millions of times if you want. So you have a huge pile of these, these little sequence snippets. And the first thing that you'll want to do is just get the majority sequence, right? So the, what is the most common, common virus sequence in a particular sample? And a phylogenetic tree, meaning a relatedness graph of them, is depicted here. Each color is one of these individuals that we sequenced. So that would be one individual. That would be another individual. Somewhere here in the center, 
would be the sequence that got transmitted from human to chimp. This has evolved over these, <laughs> from chimp to human, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, maybe it also happened the other way around, you just don't. <laughs> but yes, um, chimp to human. And then at some point, there's the point where that individual that we, that we get samples from got infected. And we have samples here. In this particular case, the first one is at the start of the millennium. And then we have samples every few months to a year. And from one sample to the next, you have these little branches, little distances. And those are basically the mutations that accumulated over this, over this time frame. Right? And each of them we, we sequenced at, at great depth. Now we can look a little deeper into what actually happens as you go from one sample to the next. And this is sort of illustrated. Here, what you see in this, in this collection of graphs here are mutations at different time points in a particular region of the genome. This is the P17 gene. It's a rather short 350 nucleotide genome. So this is just 3% of, of the entire HIV genome. And that would be one mutation that's present at 10% four months after that individual got infected. Right? And there's a few rarer ones. If you look five years later, you have many more, many more mutations that segregate. And after eight years, there's actually almost 10 mutations in that gene that we observe in, all, in pretty much all reads that we see. Down here, you have, these, you have trajectories of, of these individual mutations. right? So that might be the green one here, which rose from nothing to one, and then it just stayed there. There's some that come up and then go away again. There's actually many that stay low between sort of 1% and 10% that are just bouncing around. But you know, even in this sort of very short, very short part of the genome, you see a large number of mutations that, that, um, that spread through the population throughout that infection. And you know, some fraction of these mutations arise because they are necessary to evade the immune system, to evade for, they're necessary for the virus to replicate in presence of the immune system because the old variant, this initial, this initial virus, is well recognized by the immune system. And that is shown here in some, some older data from the group of Doug Richman, where they actually they isolated virus <coughs> at a large number of time points and antibodies from plasma at a large number of time points. And what you see here as the color code is the degree to which that plasma in which antibodies are are floating about, the degree to which that plasma neutralizes the virus. And what you see is that early virus is always neutralized by late plasma, while late virus is never neutralized by early plasma. And contempor contemporaneous virus is typically doesn't neutralize either, meaning the virus is always six, three to six months ahead, in quotes, of the immune system and continues to replicate through time. So uh, yes. So we decided that we want to, yeah, we studied these different mutations that accumulated here in more detail. So there's those mutations that, that arise because the immune system forces them onto the virus. And then there's others, which just happen because of this random error-prone replication. And the random error-prone replication, those mutations tend to accumulate at sites where, the, where a mutation doesn't actually change the protein. Right? The genetic code is quite redundant in that there are 64 codons for only 20 amino acids. So there's a large number of sites that you can mutate without actually changing, changing the, the proteins that make up the virus. And at those sites, you see that mutations accumulate. So this is the, the fraction of reads that we see mutated at those sites after, after the time since infection. So this is you know, 2,500 days, so around about eight years. That fraction accumulates rather linearly. And it does so with a quite different slope, depending on what kind of mutations you look at. So you see that mutations A to G are much slower than mutations G to A. And mutations like uh, C to G and C to T are even a lot slower. So those are the mutations that, that don't matter. But these mutations, they provide a baseline. These mutation rates, they provide a baseline 
on top of which we can analyze what happens at mutations that actually do matter. So mutations that do matter are mostly these immune escape mutations. And just as a preliminary thought, each of us has a different immune system. Right? The immune system is characterized by these so-called HLA alleles. So these are specific locus, loci in the genome, specific locations in the genome that code for protein that present protein snippets on the surface of our cells. And depending on, and if they present a virus, a foreign protein snippet, then there's other cells that will then induce that cell to kill itself. And the virus population will then evolve to avoid being presented. Right? So every one of us, if we were HIV infected, would be selecting for different mutations in the virus. Right? But the virus is transmitted from one individual to the next. So it would need to accumulate different mutations in every individual. But most of these mutations will actually hurt the virus. Right? Most of these mutations will somehow reduce the functioning of the proteins that make up the virus because yeah, the virus, you, know, you can't just mess with the protein in arbitrary ways. Right? So the question then arises, as different humans select for different mutations, how does the virus maintain integrity of these proteins over a long, long time? And there could be sort of two somewhat fundamentally different ways of dealing with it. So if there is an initial sequence and it sits in a space in, in so there's a high dimensional space of all possible sequences, the infecting sequence is by definition a functioning virus. It's a very, it's a well adapted virus. And then the immune system forces mutations onto that virus, which re will re push the virus into a, into a region of sequence space that isn't quite as good in terms of replication. Right? It's necessary in that particular individual because otherwise the immune system would, 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 would recognize the virus. But in terms of replicating, making new copies of itself, it's not a good idea. The question then arises, is the virus just going to hang out here and wait until it's transmitted to the next individual and undo that mutation? Or are there other mutations that happen in the vicinity that fix this problem. So one thing that you could think of if there is sort of in a, a protein is a three-dimensional structure. And if you mutate one amino acid, you might have to mutate another, the neighboring amino acid to make things fit again. Right? That would be sort of a compensatory mutation that this is called. And yeah, we wanted to know which one of these processes, both of these happen. We don't know that both of these happen, but it's sort of quite controversial to what degree one or the other is, is dominating. So in, in HIV and in those data that we have, we have a very good way to look at this. Because as I told you in the beginning, HIV, since its human chimp transmission, has diversified 10, 20%. And it has diversified in an almost star-like manner. So this is, again, some kind of global HIV phylogeny. All these different things are, all these different tips are sequences from HIV positive people that get sampled today. Somewhere here in the middle is the transmission from chimp to humans. And we are now observing in many different individuals what happens at the last 10 years of this tree. Right? Think of it as a, as a yeah, tree with rings, right? and we are just adding layers to it. And reversions would be mutations that actually make the virus more similar to the middle, while things like these compensatory mutations would be mutations that make it less similar. Right? Most mutations will make it less similar just by entropy. Right? So the, if the diameter here is uh, something to the tune of 10%, 90% 90, 90 of all random mutations would make it less similar, 10% right? more similar. Um, but we can try to quantify that. And in a way, so we, have, we observe, so there's time going down here. We have some infection event, and we observe this initial sequence. And we can then ask sort of at what parts of the genome does that initial sequence coincide with the center of the tree? And where does it differ? And the differences here are sort of depicted by little red dots. 
And then we can track this sequence through time and look at how many of these red dots go away, like how many sites are there where it becomes more similar to that center of the tree sequence, and how, and how many sites do we pick up additional mutations. So looking at this separately for yeah, those sites with the red dots and those that don't, so sites where you agree with the, with the center of the tree, uh, where you agree with the center of the tree or where you're different from the center of the tree, you find a very, very different rate at which these mutations accumulate. So those top two curves here correspond to the red dot sites, so where we initially disagree with the center of the tree, sites where we are different from, from here. And you see that we have a rate of evolution that's around about 10 times faster than at the other sites where we, are initially, where we initially agree with the center of the tree. So these dashed and solid lines here are two different definitions of center. One is taking the total of the center of everything, and the other one is taking the center of these subtypes. They behave qualitatively the same way. Um, just for completeness, they are shown both here. But so the first observation is, at sites where we initially differ from that center of the tree, the virus accumulates mutations at a rate that's about 10 times faster. So now you might um, argue that, yes, where it's different from that center of the tree, those are the sites that don't really matter that much anyway, so maybe that's to be expected. But if you then actually start stratifying this, you know, the, the rate that we had seen here, um, if you start stratifying that by how often this site mutates globally, by how, how much variation we see at positions, you see that this effect is most pronounced at the most conserved position. So what you, what, here we plot this divergence from the founder, so this rate, the slope of this, of this curve that I've just shown, as a function of the variability of the number of changes we observe in the global HIV population. And those are the sites where we, where we see a lot of diversity, right? where it doesn't really seem to matter what, it, what, what the state at this position is. And we still see about a threefold enrichment. Those would be the sites where we basically never see any changes. And here, this difference is about a thousandfold. So meaning at, at sites where the virus hardly ever mutates, if it initially disagrees from that global consensus, it will get back to it. It will mutate back with a, with a probability of 0.5 over the course of an infection. So there's a very strong tendency to revert those, mut those, those mutations back to the center of the tree. And the virus really is attracted to some, to some uh, kind of a, a center of mass around which is orbiting. Right? Entropy drives it away from it, but it really is attracted to some, to some sequence that defines what an HIV, what an HIV virus looks like. You can then sort of, w once you have uh, established that there is such a sequence that the virus wants to mutate back to, you can push this a little further and, and ask, what actually are the costs? You know, how much of a replication detriment does a mutation at this site induce on the virus? And this is where the mutation rate comes in that we determined earlier. So we have a mutation away from a preferred state with a rate mu that we measured. Right? And then we know that these non-preferred states, they are selected against with a certain, with a certain growth deficit. Right? If you then ask, how does the frequency of, of, of non-consensus, non-preferred variants at this site change over time, they accumulate with the mutation rate, and they are purged sort of by the detriment that they inflict on replication, which naively results in some equilibrium frequency. So that's the ratio of these two numbers. And if we manage to measure this quantity to an accurate, sufficient accuracy, we can turn this equation around and sort of estimate the, the fitness cost of each individual mutation in the genome. And I didn't think this would work, but it actually gives quite meaningful results. So what you see here is this HIV fitness cost, so the, the, the cost of mutating a particular site 
across the genome of the virus. So this is the genome of the virus here with the different genes and proteins that are annotated. The top lines are mutations, so the solid lines are mutations that change the amino acid sequence, while these dashed lines down here are mutations that don't change the amino acid sequence. And what you immediately see, yes, so this makes sense to some degree, those amino acid changing mutations, they tend to be very costly. Those that don't, they don't seem to matter much. But then there are a few sort of conspicuous peaks here, like this one, in the synonymous mutations. There's, uh, yeah, this one, one doesn't see too well. There's um, you know, this peak here, and a number of, number of other peaks. And you know, if this method gives, uh, gives us meaningful results, those peaks should correspond to something that people have observed earlier. And indeed, they do. So this peak here on the, on the very right that I just showed you, that is a so-called polypurine tract, where these fitness costs shoot up. The different lines here, the blue one averages. It's a, bit of a, it's a small sliding average. The blue one averages the fitness cost of amino acid changing mutations. The red one averages the fitness cost of mutations that don't change the amino acid sequence. And what you see here, you know, the red, don't, the synonymous mutations that don't change amino acid sequence don't seem to matter much here. But then it shoots up, has two kind of defined peaks here, and sort of drops back down. You find similar signals in different regions of the genome. Here, there would be the central polypurine tract that has a similar regulatory role. So these are regions of the genome, sorry. These are regions of the genome that don't matter because they code for a particular protein, but because they regul regulate the virus life cycle. So those are the polypurine tracts. They're important in priming the replication of the virus genome. Then there's other sites here, like these splice acceptor sites that are important to chop the virus genome into different pieces that make useful proteins. Um, then there is one region here. It's a boundary between two genes that is very important to make the polymerase that makes the amino acid, acids, so the polypeptides, make that slip a little bit to operate in two different reading frames. And all these regulatory signals you see the very prominently in, in this fitness landscape. So it, it gives you a window into how much it costs to mutate a particular site in the real in vivo system. Right? It's, not, it's not measured in some cell culture system. So it's, it's really sort of looked into the cost of mutating particular parts of the genome in the human body right? as, it's, as the virus is replicating. Good. Um, now I was going to move on to the next question. So this is all of what I've shown you so far is what happens in an untreated HIV infection. So while the virus is replicating without interfering with medication. And these individuals from which these samples were that we selected, those were selected such that we have samples throughout the period during which the virus replicated on without therapy. So the gray bar here is the, is the period of unmedicated virus replication. At some point, all these people went on treatment, successful treatment, and they're all alive today. And Jan Albert and my collaborators say, ask them to come back to the doctor's office and for another blood draw, or three in this case so that we can look at the latently integrated virus. So what I told you before, the virus was, is, is integrated into millions and millions of humans of cells that are still circulating in these individuals. And we wanted to find out, how does this virus that you find up to 18 years after treatment got started, how does that virus relate to the virus that was replicating before treatment? Um, and because this has been a quite contentious question in the field, does it actually change over this time, or is it just a frozen snapshot that gets archived there? Now, it's an easy answer. It doesn't change. <laughs> Contrary to what many other people say, it just stays there without any movement. This is 
exemplified here in two, in two of these individuals, sort of patient one and patient eight. And what is shown is a phytogenetic tree, meaning it's a that family tree of viruses, where the color code is the same as on the previous slide. So yellow is very early in infection, black is sort of the last untreated sample, and then you have these, um, these symbols that, that correspond to this, the sequences after many years of treatment. And what you see is that these circles and uh, the triangles and the squares, they sit smack on the, on the blue and uh, on the black and red, red circles. For many of them, we actually find an exact match. 10 years later, we find an exact match of the sequence um, to something that circulated many years, many years earlier. Right, so here, you find an exact match here which you, know, re you really wouldn't expect if it had, been continue, had continued to replicate in the same way. So this is somewhat more quantified here in this graph where we show the distance along the tree over time. And it's all sort of arranged such that um, the start of treatment falls into the origin of the plot. Before treatment, you have, you know, this has a very defined slope, meaning the virus population is accumulating mutations. After treatment, it's flat. Right? And it's, it's flat for many, many years. So this, um, at least in what you see circulating in the blood, you have no evidence of ongoing replication. And that, in many ways, is good news, because if people figure out a way how to flush out this reservoir, how to, how to remove these integrated viruses, even either by activating them to, to produce virus and then kill the cell, or cut it out in some fancy way. If that succeeds, that doesn't seem to be a pocket where it's replicating and, and replenishing, right? It's just stuck there. OK, having talked about um, what you see when you sequence, I now want to move on a little bit to how do you actually you know, try to rationalize, understand, and model that kind of dynamics. So what people, people typically do when they analyze sets of sequences that are evolving, this branch of science that does this is called population genetics. They write down a model of a population of n individuals, and they come up with some rules that map that population to the next generation. Right here, so the one individual has two offspring. This one has none offspring, one offspring. Here, this one has three. One of them is mutated. So of course, this map gets iterated. And after a long time, you end up sampling a bunch of sequences. So this usually is a you know, small fraction of the entire population. And in these sequences, you observe mutations. So these are, again, sort of my colored circles here. And from these from these sequences that have genetic diversity, meaning that have mutations, you're trying to learn about the processes that, that go from one generation to another, right? Sort of how, how things are mutating, how these mutations affect replication, how many offspring some, some, some individuals have as opposed to others, and so forth. So the way these two are connected is via the ensemble of trees that this map generates, right? So, you know, this. This map, which branch has things branching into multiple or things going extinct, right? If you trace the lineages, that generates a tree, and this tree you can reconstruct from the from the mutations, right? So this red mutation here that kind of groups these two sequences, um, the yellow mutation groups these two, and so forth, right? You can reconstruct this family tree from these mutations, and the evolutionary processes that map one generation to the ne next are sort of connected by the ensemble of trees to the, to the genetic diversity that you observe. So that's sort of the general mindset. Right? And if the, if the population is asexual, then there is sort of one tree for the entire genome. If there's recombination, then the tree changes as you move along the genome. Right? That makes things a little bit more complicated. But at each, um, at each position of the genome, you still think that there is some kind of a tree-like structure along which these things have evolved. The standard model that people use in this context is a so-called neutral model, 
we're, and it's a very boring model in many ways, where all individuals are identical in the sense that, you know, it doesn't, they're all exchangeable and their properties don't depend on their genome. And then everything that matters from one generation to the next is sort of just the, the stochastic properties of this offspring distribution, which is the same for everybody. The resulting process is called the Kingman coalescent, or you can write down a forward sort of diffusion, diffusion description for the population composition. Um, you know, this is very, you know, nice and pretty, and everything is easy to calculate. So people have spent a lot of time, you know, figuring out all these things. It's very good. And then you can add perturbations like, uh, you know, a single locus that is under selection, a single mutation that matters and so forth on top of this neutral framework. But in our RNA viruses that are so rapidly evolving, there's lots and lots of sites that are, that matter, right? You know, almost all non-synonymous positions have have substantial effects on virus replication. So you can't just assume that all this genetic diversity that's floating about is neutral. And in particular, we know that it's adapting all the time. It needs to change. It's in a, it's in a perpetual sort of race to change. Right? So we and others have been working for a long time to come up with, with sort of a different starting point. Right? You don't want to start this from a neutral model where you know you, you're, you're very, very far from the generic behavior that you expect to find. So we were taking a completely different approach, saying, yes, there is a lot of mutations. And if all of these mutations have some moderate contribution to the replication rate of the organism, and these contributions are roughly of similar size, then you expect a somewhat bell-shaped distribution of replicating rates, replication rates in the population. Right? And then by definition, of course, those in the high fitness tail will take over, those will go away. Right? And it's a very generic model of a competition process where there is some limiting resource and there is diversity and diversity in, in, in rates and success and some process by which you can change those, that would be mutation. Right? There's a different limit here where you have the rare large effect mutations that I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, but yeah, so that is a very interesting model to study and a large number of uh, our colleagues uh, and myself, Boris Freeman, Daniel Fischer, uh, Bernard Derrida, all these people have, have, have studied, studied these, these kind of models and I think we have come to a reasonably nice understanding. Just to give you some intuitive idea what these trees and these models look like, the left hand tree is the neutral tree. The right-hand tree is, is something that I pulled from a simulation of, of a model where you have a lot of these you know, little differences in replication rate. What you see here, so this is the present, right? Up, up there is the past. What you see here is that things rapidly come together, and you're pretty quickly left with a few lineages that often kind of splits the population 50-50. Over here, Nothing much happens in the beginning. And then you have a rapid reduction, sometimes these almost burst-like behavior, and very skewed branching in that there's one long branch that goes all the way down here. Everything else hangs off this end. And this is reoccurring in a nested fashion. Time is going down. Time is going down, yes. So that's the present here. So, what gives rise to that behavior? It turns out it can be understood in reasonably intuitive terms. The limiting process ends up being a so-called bolthausen slipman coalescent, which is an object that has been studied in sort of tree-valued probabilistic processes quite a bit. When you sample individuals, they come from the middle of your fitness distribution, right? You're not typically going to sample the, the, top, the top individuals. If you trace their lineages back in time, the ancestors are going to be, they tend to be more fit than the children, right? Because everybody has parents, <laughs> not everybody has children. Right? So that, um, that ancestors, by, by going back in time, you bias towards rapidly replicating things. So at some point, everything is going to end up in the, in the tip of that 
that distribution, that population distribution. And up until you get there, nothing much happens because there's a large number of individuals in the middle of the distribution, so it's difficult for, for things to meet in some abstract way, right? But once everything is cramped into the high fitness tail, that's where the real competition happens. And this is where some individuals, by strike of luck, can acquire a bunch of mutations that you know, puts them ahead of the pack, allows them to replicate for a little while at a faster rate than everybody else, and seed a large fraction of the population. And this is what corresponds to these sort of multiple merger events, so these rapid little explosions far up in the tree. This corresponds to one individual running ahead a little bit, expanding before the, before the rest catches up. And that can result in sort of microscopic fractions of the population descending from a single individual in, over a rather short period of time. In fact, if you, if you work it out, it has a, a power law tail distribution, so the fraction of the population that you, that, you, that you beget. And this gives rise to properties of these trees that are quite different from these neutral coalescent tr trees. Some of these one can sort of rather ni nicely, nicely calculate. One of them would be the so-called site frequency spectrum, where you simply ask, how often do I observe a mutation that's present in 1% of the population, say, or 5% or 10%. So like it's illustrated here, the yellow one would be a mutation that I observe in 50% of the population, this in 5 out of 6, 1 third, and so forth. Right? You can go across the entire genome, count how many of these you observe in these different abundance categories, and make a histogram. So this is a, such a histogram done in simulations here, because this is uh, we, we wanted to work out these different asymptotics, it's plotted in a way that both axes are logarithmic, so it has a log, log it axis, so you see both asymptotics. And the defining feature here is that you have a very steep divergence on that end, the second power, and another divergence as you approach frequency one, meaning 99.99%. It again goes up and has this non-monotonous shape with a, with a valley in the middle. And this non-monotonous behavior, that again has to do with this very skewed branching because any mutation that happens on this branch here is going to be present in almost everybody other than that, that lineage, right? And the, the, the tendencies of this process is to generate this very skewed branching that is responsible for, for, these, for this uptick, this non monotonicity So do we see this in HIV? Yes, we do. So this is exactly the same plot where the black curves are the HIV data. The red curve is the prediction from these models. Again, here is sort of just determined by a simulation. That's why it's slightly, slightly wiggly. And the blue one is what the neutral model would be predicting. So it seems quite clear that the neutral model is not a terribly good fit and that the, this, this coalescent model, this beta coalescent model, this Wolfhausen Snittman coalescent, is a much better point of departure to, to start to understand specific features of evolution of HIV within an individual. And this brings me to the last part of the talk. So I've argued that these bursts in the tree, these little, little tiny explosions that you see in the tree, that they correspond to individuals that transiently are ahead of the pack and have high fitness. So if, if that's true, can we use this to turn it around and given a tree read fitness off it, right? Can we, if, if, I, if I give you a tree, can we say that those are the individuals that, that, that are fit and those are the ones that are going to take over as opposed to the other way around? So this would be quite handy to, to do in the context of influenza. What you see right now is a phylogenetic tree of influenza H3N2 that is the one of the four influenza lineages that is circulating among humans, and it tends to be the one that is, that is evolving most rapidly and also giving rise to the most serious and severe infections. Last season was dominated by exactly that lineage. And this tree is colored by date of isolation. So these blue sequences here are from 85. The red ones are from the last, last two, three years. And what you see is at any given point in time, there's very little diversity, right? Sort of any color sort of always is kind of a very defined blob, but it's turning over very fast, right? From one year to the next, 
Now, those, those viruses um, descend from one viruses, virus over here, but there's no diversity that carries over over many years. Right? It has this very ladder-like phylogeny where you constantly replace the previous population by some more adapted one. These adaptations, they tend to be, again, immune escape adaptations. So that this is a structure of the HA molecule, the HA protein that sits on the surface of the virus and is the one that is most visible to the immune system. And where humans infected with, H, with, with influenza develop antibodies against. And all these colored amino acids here, they, they are mutations that changed over the last couple of years. Or they are positions that changed over the last couple of years because antibodies bind there and the virus needs to change to avoid these antibodies and reinfect individuals that had influenza a few years back. This is an HA3? This is an HA3, yeah. Oh, this is a bunch of um, bunch of isolates from Athens, which you know they might have done something funny to them in the lab. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they they probably should have been pruned. <laughs> um, but for this reason, because it has this rapid turnover, we need to update the vaccines very often, and all these gray little crosses here correspond to strains that have been used in the influenza vaccine over the last um, over the last. 20 years. And typically, the this branch of the influenza vaccine is updated every two, three years. So if we had a way to anticipate what is going to circulate in the future, we would make this process of choosing things that go into the vaccine sort of more accurate and potentially a better, better match for the circulating populations. So we try to, we try to do that. And yeah, so we envision a scenario like this, where you have a present population and a future population. And there's some distribution of fitness in the background that we don't know. We sample those. And we would like to find this isolate, say, that is most closely related to the future. And then you know, maybe put that into the flu vaccine. right? So that would be the ideal case scenario. Um, so does this work? The you know, from that theoretical model that I told you about earlier, we derived a, a method to construct the posterior distribution of fitness or growth rate on the entire tree. And it corresponds of attaching an, an object to every branch in the tree that tells you how likely it is that the, the upper part of the branch had a certain fitness, the lower branch had a certain fitness, given that you observe this tree topology. Since it's a tree, it actually has a fairly simple structure and that it's just multiplication of a whole bunch of sort of binaries. And it means that you can efficiently marginalize it. Much of that we have to solve numerically, but um, we understand the asymptotics reasonably well. Evaluating this marginal distribution then gives us a score for every virus or every tip of the tree that we can use to rank them. We first tested this in simulations, meaning we make a model of, um, of the virus genomes and fitness, and we let them mutate sort of random number generator. We sample these sequences, erase all information about fitness, use a standard reconstruction tool for trees, and then apply this algorithm to the trees and infer the fitness and try to compare it to what the simulation actually, actually was using. This is a typical outcome. It works um, reasonably well. You have the true fitness here, the inferred fitness here, and you explain about a third of the variation that you see. But you know, certainly enough to pick something in the upper, upper right corner. This inference gets better if these mutations by which fitness changes are many, many small steps as opposed to a few big steps. So that makes sense, right? It's harder to predict uh, earthquakes than the weather. Um, there's a whole bunch of other validations that, that we did. The question is, does it work for flu? So this is a screenshot of a web page that Trevor Bedford and myself made. And the red dot that you see is always our prediction. And the gray dot is, now the prediction is here. The gray dot, uh, the gray cross is the vaccine. So the prediction is here. And then the vaccine, the vaccine will sort of follow it in a somewhat lagged manner. Now the vaccine was very, uh, very adventurous. And 
now you'll see the vaccine going coming here. And then you'll see the vaccine coming here. <laughs> so it can always a little bit ahead of the vaccine, which is good. We try to quantify that in a little bit more rigorous way. We're here for all of the past, um, past years of influenza where we had sufficient sequence data. We, we, we were asking, how does our prediction compare to the average genome that's circulating in a particular year? And how does it compare to the, to the best possible ones, since it's historical data? We know which one, which pick would have been the optimal one. The optimal one here for each season is the dash line. The random pick would be the solid line up here. And in about a third of the years, we managed to pick a virus that is you know, pretty close to optimal. In a few years, especially when there's very little data in the you know, 20 years back, we have only, only a few dozen sequences per year. Um, we, we do only roughly as good as random. And in the remaining years, we're kind of halfway in between. But you know, there certainly is potential here to use these kind of methods to predict um, which part of the current influence, circulating influenza viruses, which, which ones are most likely to dominate future seasons. And the you know, defining aspect of this approach is that it, you know, it doesn't actually use any influenza-specific input. Right? The only thing that we use is sort of one snapshot from which we reconstruct a tree. We don't even need sort of time-resolved data. Right? Sort of a single snapshot is in principle enough to, to get you know, some meaningful prediction as to which part of the tree are expanding and which parts are contracting. Um, and the big question right now is how, how can we improve upon that? Right? Obviously, we, there's a lot of things about influenza that we know. And it should be possible to use all these aspects to make these predictions even better. And there is you know, a number of other groups, for example, Marta Luxia and uh, Michael Lessig. Marta is at the IAS here in, in Princeton. They use a model that very much approaches the problem from the opposite angle. They try to use historical information, like if it has been observed that a particular mutation is typically associated with that branch taking over, they use that kind of historical information to predict the future. Their model does roughly as good as, as this, which doesn't use any influential specific information. And we are working on trying to combine these things to make it make it even better. But the, the fact that this approach is so generic might mean that it's also applicable to other contexts in which um, you'd like to understand which part of this, a given population is likely to take over or not. So this brings me to the end of my talk. There was, in addition to prediction, one important aspect of all of this is actually, you know, before you start predicting, you have to know what's going on right now. <laughs> and for influenza, we, we know very well what's going on right now because the WHO is coordinating a huge surveillance efforts where thousands of influenza genomes are sequenced every year. With other diseases like Zika and Ebola, this is much less the case. And together with Trevor Bedford, um, I have developed a tool that's called sort of nextstrain.org that allows different groups to pool sequence information and do sort of real-time updated phylogenetic analysis such that everybody can see what's going on with their data in the context of everybody else's data. And public health authorities can, can uh, act upon that. So that is the nextstrain web page. So this is actually a web page, right? Here. <laughs> And if you go on the, on the Zika one, this is what, what, what it shows you. So it shows you that sort of family tree here and a map of where all these isolates come from. The red ones here are those from the US. And then you can explore those, um, those data in, in sort of interactive way. For example, you put the mouse here on the on the legend, it will highlight the corresponding regions. So those are the isolates from Florida mainly. Then at the base of this, you see the or 
or it's the, the, the isolates from the Dominican Republic, which tells you that most of these US sequences, so the, the, the US seeker probably came via tourists from the Caribbean. <laughs> then you have all the Brazilian ones, which was this big outbreak here. You can you know, play this back in time. And then actually go back forward and see what, you know, how it spread. So there was not much observed for a while, and now there is a lot of observations from Brazil, and then it's finally spreading to the U.S. via tourists through the Caribbean. So there's a, you know, a whole bunch of different ways at which you can, in which you can look at this. There's different kinds of metadata that you can overlay onto those onto those those data, and hopefully this will help too explore and understand these virus pandemics in a better way. So that's it. So I hope I've given you some sense that virus evolution is something that you can actually observe happening from month to month, year to year. That, yeah, so at least in the case of HIV, there seems to be some kind of a preferred amino acid sequence to which it always sort of comes back that there's some theoretic model of rapidly adapting populations that has sort of quite immediate practical implications in predicting future influenza, influenza strains. And you know, if you want to play with the next strain real-time analysis, feel free. It's a open, an open web page for everybody to look at. This brings to the acknowledgments. So the HIV work was really you know, it was a fantastic graduate student, Fabio Zanini, who did you know, pretty much all the work, starting from the extraction of the RNA, sequencing the bioinformatics and the analysis and everything. The virology end of this and much of the, much of the, so the wet lab work was done by, in the group of Jan Albert. Christa was the head of the genome facility. Um, Göran is the actual patient contact. Vadim was involved in the fitness landscapes. Lina and Johanna were involved in, in the work in Sweden. Then there, is, there are my collaborators on the influenza. And the theory part, there would be Oskar Holacek, who I worked with me on the Baltar Zittman coalescent, um, and Boris Schreman, who worked with me on the influenza prediction, and those two fellows on various other influenza projects. And then there is the next train, real-time tracking, um, where these people are involved, sort of Pavel Sagunetico from my group, a web developer, and two people from Travis group who've contributed to various aspects of this. Thank you very much. <laughs>